Welcome, everyone, to this edition of the Doorstep Book Talks. I'm your co-host, Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Council, Nick Vosdev. And I'm Tatiana Serafin, also Senior here at, Fellow here at Carnegie uh, in a very sunny New York, welcoming author Bethany Allen, an Axios China reporter from Taipei, to speak about her book, Beijing Rules. It's a fabulous book. I read it diligently twice because it was so good and because I had to reread it before today's fortuitous events. Biden G meeting right on the day we're talking about Beijing rules. So excited to see your coverage um, of the summit, Bethany, and, um, and to talk about the book today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'd like to dive right in and, and tell our audience that we're going to accept your questions uh, in the, the second half of our chat. Um, so please tee them up. Uh, we'll grab them when we can. Um, but just let's jump right in because this is a historic day. And and I, I want to, there's so many aspects of your book that I think are so important um, for our audience um, and for people to, to start talking about. But the number one <laughs> is because we've had this um, love-hate relationship and it's it's been very negative recently. But all of a sudden, and this is your latest piece, China state media has turned on the charm offensive. Now, even bloggers in China are saying, do we love America now? Uh, and, and so I'd like to start off with that because a, a great section of your book, which um, you know is some, a learning for all of us here in America, it's something we talk about at the doorstep, is how much China is actually doing at the doorstep, doing on the local level through its sister city programs, through working with mayors and local and student organizations. And I'd like to kind of start off because it seems like Xi has written so many love letters in the last week or so ahead of this summit. Right, isn't, isn't that amazing? He's been very busy. So what we're seeing from the Chinese side ahead of the summit is, is really quite extraordinary. There has been uh, just wall to wall, um, positive coverage, if you will, of, you know, people to people ties um, in the US China relationship, whether historically or to today. So just some examples is that she wrote a letter to a 103 year old World War II veteran who was a member of the Flying Tigers, which was a, a squadron of um, American pilots who helped fight the Japanese with together with China. Uh, you know, very symbolic there of the solidarity that the US and China and that, you know, regular American soldiers and Chinese soldiers once had in their fight, um, you know, against the Japanese during World War II. And we've seen, uh, you know, for example, Chinese state media once again bring up Xi Jinping's relationship with Muscatine, Iowa, where he, he stayed um, for a number of weeks in 1985 with the host family. And he has maintained some ties with uh, the people that he met there over the years. So once again, bringing up his old friends is, is the phrase that they use, the, the old, his old friends in Iowa. Um, and also uh, the Philadelphia Orchestra was uh, in Beijing last week for their uh, for to give a performance in celebration of the 50th anniversary of their first ever performance in China. And so this has just been, you know, wall to wall across Chinese state media. And I really want to emphasize how unusual this is now. Really, the last time I saw this kind of positive coverage of, of the U.S. in Chinese state media was in 2015 when uh, Xi Jinping had a meeting with President Obama when the U.S.-China relationship was still on pretty good footing. The, the last time that she was in the U.S. for the Mar-a-Lago summit with Donald Trump in 2017, there was not, we did not see this kind of, um, you know, very, you know, this positive emphasis on Americans and American society. And certainly not last year when uh, Xi Jinping and Joe Biden met for the first time as leaders of their respective countries on the sidelines of the G20 summit. So it, it seems that what we're seeing is a, a good faith effort or the you know strong desire to appear as though China is putting in a good faith effort to not only improve their state to state ties, but to help uh, ameliorate the image of the US 
among Chinese people. So Bethany, can I ask you uh, sort of the motivation behind this uh, uptick of positive coverage? Is this uh, directed because China wants some things from the United States, that this is a uh, let's be friends and here's our list of things we would like? Is this coming from a position of confidence that China can afford now to be more uh, positive in its coverage of the U.S. because uh, of China's rise? So what's the motivation about why, uh, particularly prior to this meeting, given what we've seen in U.S.-China relations over the last, uh, certainly over the last number of months, but even over the last number of years, competition, sanctions, uh, we're checking you, you're checking us. We talk about decoupling and de-risking and the like. Uh, what What is motivating uh, the leadership uh, to decide uh, that now is the time to to sort of reemphasize, accentuate the positive uh, in the relationship? Yeah, well, there's there's several factors. and and first is that you know China's leaders, the same as American leaders, understand that the stakes are really high. We're talking about the two, you know, the world's two superpowers, the, you know, they're both nuclear armed superpowers. And the U.S.-China relationship has really taken a nosedive in the past year and a half. And that is dangerous. That is clearly dangerous. And the Chinese side knows that as well. And we saw an interesting admission of this. Um, from Xi Jinping, in fact, a year ago, when he met with Biden, when he said that, you know, something to the effect of, we have not met the world's expectations mm -hmm. in terms of how we are managing this important bilateral relationship. This is something that Xi Jinping also recognizes, uh, that the world expects and needs these two countries to, at a very bare minimum, not go to war, and get along and preferably work to work towards some crucial common goals such as combating climate change. But that's not the only thing that's going on. What's also happening is that Xi Jinping realizes that China's economy now is truly slowing. It's not experiencing this the rapid economic growth that China has enjoyed for, for decades, that there's been a true slowdown um, amid you know a real estate crisis and debt crisis, and China needs trade partners. Uh, needs to have you know more robust business and trade ties with with more countries, and that is exacerbated by the efforts spearheaded by the U.S. but now increasingly widely adopted uh, across Europe and. Um, democratic partners and allies in Asia of diversifying supply chains and business partners away from China because of the risks that uh, you know investment in China now poses. And you know, let's be clear, those risks have been created by the Chinese Communist Party because of the way that they weaponize ties to their economy. So you know, Xi Jinping realizes that he needs to do something different than he has been doing for the past four or five years. And what's also in, in the kind of in the cards here is that really, the, you know, the U.S. isn't alone in this the way the Trump administration was in 2018 when they began their pivot to a much tougher China policy. You know, now European nations are absolutely coming along. Um, along with Japan and and other nations, India, you know. So I think that that she recognizes that he can't, you know, continue to allow wolf warrior diplomacy and this the same kind of hard edge that he has adopted um, in recent years. Although saying that, you know, a lot of your book talks about his economic statecraft and the levers that he can pull with corporations. Um, because of our kind of four decade pivot towards government helping business or helping regulate business to this more deregulated, you know, go for it market economy where companies seeking profits will make concessions to be in the Chinese market. And there are a couple of examples here in the book 
um, I'd like to talk about Zoom <laughs> because I admit I didn't know the background of, of how deeply Zoom was tied to China. And I think maybe some of our audience might not. And so I'd like to talk about that as an example um, of companies um, acceding to belong to the Chinese market. And the other example you had was uh, Meta or Facebook not being in China, although I just recently read they made a deal to sell their VR equipment there. So everybody still wants a piece of that pie. Absolutely. And, you know, we've seen headlines for the past few months now kind of proclaiming, you know, the end of the Chinese economic miracle or saying that the Chinese economy is doomed. And you know, that's really uh, an exaggeration. And it's really important to note that the Chinese economy is still the second largest economy in the world and it's still growing. It's not even in recession. So it's it's still an appealing market for many, many businesses around the world. To, you know, to, to get into Zoom, the issue with Zoom, so, you know, Zoom is an American company founded in California by a Chinese American in 2011. But what sets it apart from its counterparts like, you know, Google Meet and WebEx um, is that not only did it have, uh, you know, operations in China, but, uh, you know, it had a, not only was it selling its platform in China, it actually had most of its research and development team based in China. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute, but before we do, um, you know, what, what happened initially to Zoom was very similar uh, what, as what we've seen to, to other companies. In 2019, in September 2019, the Chinese government blocked Zoom as a platform in China. So Chinese consumers didn't have access to the platform of, of, of the video conferencing software of Zoom. Uh, and you know, Chinese uh, law enforcement and security officials came to Zoom, their headquarters in Hangzhou, and said, if you want to be able to sell your product in the Chinese market again, you need to basically submit a what they're called a rectification plan, which is you need to show us how you're going to better implement the censorship that we demand, um, more actively surveil your users, and respond uh, immediately to requests from our security services to hand over information about your users upon demand. And so Zoom hopped to attention and put together a rectification plan. This, this was not public, the, the Zoom's, Zoom being blocked in China was public, but the fact that Zoom was required to submit this rectification plan, this was not public at the time. Two months later, the, the block was lifted and Zoom was once again um, allowed to you know, sell its, its platform to Chinese users. As part of this rectification plan, however, uh, Zoom was also required to appoint a, an, one of their employees as a liaison with China's security services. So it's um, Ministry of S State Security, which is its intelligence arm, and the Ministry of Public Security, its law enforcement arm. And this is where it's the fact that it had around 700 employees based in China really matters because it's interesting in Zoom's disclosures, its public disclosures in the US, it acknowledged that having these employees based in China was a risk. It was a reputational risk. It was a security risk. But in that the public disclosure, the company said that it was worth it to them because it made the company more profitable because it was the lower, the operating costs were lower. It was good for their bottom line. So they decided to keep these employees there. Well, one of those employees then was appointed as the liaison to the public, to public security services. But what happened as the, you know, when the pandemic hit, I mean, of course that was great for Zoom. What a windfall. They went from 10 million daily users to 300 million daily users by the by April of 2022. That was also a windfall for China's security services who realized now that they had access to hundreds of millions of global users. So they started making these demands of this liaison uh, to send information um, and provide personal information about users who were based outside of China. And this uh, liaison uh, employee also began trying to shut down meetings that were happening out of China. And one of these meetings that he was able to successfully shut down, for example, was a Tiananmen Memorial 
And he did it in a pretty interesting way, which was in some cases, this employee whose name was Julian Jean had to subvert some of Zoom's own internal safety uh, protocols. But in some cases, what he was doing was was known to, to other Zoom employees. But, you know, this is an example of what I'm about to tell you of him kind of subverting Zoom's policies. He uh, created a set of email accounts and fabricated evidence that one of these uh, Tiananmen memorials that was happening in New York uh, was um, breaking Zoom user guidelines. And some of the, the evidence that he submitted through these various different email accounts was that the screenshots showing that some of the users, the users of this meeting were ISIS supporters. Some accounts were ISIS supporters. Some accounts were Bosque separatists. Mm. Some accounts were porn accounts. And some accounts were gambling accounts. Now, if Zoom had done even the slightest bit of due diligence on these, um, you know, supposed um, complaints, they would have realized that this made zero narrative sense for all these different accounts to be in this pro-democracy um, meeting that was being held in New York. But in any case, it worked. The meeting was shut down, and this was one of several meetings that were affected. So this is an example of how in order to please Chinese security services and thus be uh, granted access to ongoing access to the Chinese market and in order to support their bottom line, Zoom essentially, uh, you know, let the enemy in through the back door or really the front door since it was an official Zoom employee and the Zoom employee became in effect an embedded agent of the Chinese government uh, in in the company itself. I mean, I think that this is an example where all, uh, you know, people at our doorstep or all Americans can really understand, right? Most people here know of Zoom, use Zoom every day. Um, and, and kind of a, a great example of the interconnection, the tech interconnections that are so important, uh, which you then go into in terms of further surveillance, right? The opportunities that China has to create this network of surveillance outside of China. So not only surveillance that impacts those, you know, you know, citizens of China, but also outside of China um, and also impacting, you know, the operations of a U.S. based company in the U.S. So I think that's really important to parse out. Um, and before we, we you know, I want to go into talk more about surveillance. I do want to say uh, one of the justifications that you mentioned in your book for Zoom and for other companies to accede to these demands to be in the market is, well, you know, that's the cost of business. Like, of course we have to uh, you know, appreciate their laws and, and, and abide by them. You know? And that's just what all businesses do. And it's so it's very interesting to me the ways that companies justify the things that they do that, that people, investors, and regular people in the U.S. might not understand. Um, so before we go to the surveillance, can you talk about any other examples of companies uh, that are doing this? Um, you know, you mentioned Hollywood. We did have a podcast about um, Hollywood uh, as well and what what it does to China. And it's, I think it's worth repeating, you know, kind of how other uh, sectors accede to the demands uh, that the Chinese market asks for. Well, absolutely. And there are so many examples, you know, from from so many of our, um, you know, most popular and famous brands and, and companies. And if you want to go to the Hollywood example, I mean, that's I like to go back to that one over and over again, because it, it's so it's it was such a success from the Chinese government's perspective. I mean, when did this really start? It started in 1997 when there were two movies made about two Hollywood movies made that showed Tibet in a very compassionate light and showed, you know, Tibet and the Tibetan people as victims of Chinese military aggression. One of them was Brad, Brad Pitt's uh, Seven Years in Tibet, and the other one was Kundun, Martin Scorsese, um, Disney film. And what happened was, uh, is that both of those production companies, so Columbia, TriStar, and Disney were blocked from the Chinese market after that. In Columbia TriStar's case, it was essentially a, a permanent kind of a, you know, per permanently blacklisted. And that was, that hit the Hollywood, you know, the whole Hollywood industry, you know, like a, like an earthquake. It, it just, it, it shocked everyone. And for the next 26 years up to the present day, 
there has not been one single major Hollywood film that has crossed any major Chinese Communist Party red lines. No movies about Tibet, no movies about Xinjiang, no movies about you know, um, uh, Chinese human rights violations, you know, no movies about the, you know, the Tiananmen, none of that, none of that. And what's especially extraordinary about this is that in 19, 1997, the Chinese economy was about one tenth the size of the U.S. economy. It had it did not have the, you know, the the massive pull that it does now. But even more amazing is that the Chinese box office at the time was negligible. Those movies did not lose any money in the. I mean, those production companies did not lose money in the Chinese market. You know, for for years, even if they had been blocked for years, because there was no money to be made. That that level of control and censorship was effective merely on the promise of future wealth. And I really like to emphasize that. Now we see this these days because now there is money to be made. You know, there's fortunes to be made and lost in the Chinese market across pretty much any sector you can imagine. So we see this kind of mechanism being used with hotel chains like Marriott, with uh, fast fashion and retail, clothing retail companies like Zara. Uh, we've seen it with the NBA. Uh, I think we're all you know, familiar with this example as well. During the Hong Kong pro-democracy protests in 2019, Daryl Morey, who was the manage at the time the manager of the Houston Rockets, tweeted in support of those protests. And the Chinese market essentially, you know, the doors essentially slammed shut for the NBA um, at that time. And it's estimated that the NBA lost $200 million in revenue. Um, from that. So lots of examples. And it doesn't just affect U.S. companies, of course. It also affects, uh, you know, companies from, effect from from any country in the world. Yeah. Um, speaking of companies, a bunch of business leaders are sitting down with G today, tonight. I think yes. they're having a big dinner. Uh, what are you expecting from that? And I know Musk is going to be there. Uh, you know, Musk, the uh, person who operates outside of any diplomatic system. Do you think he is going to pull any levers himself with Xi? Does he have any levers to pull with Xi? Or is all the economic statecraft that you talk about in your book, and is all that power in Beijing rules? Yeah. Well, I, I think that, that I mean, this is really a, a very interesting. And according to some reporting that I've seen, uh, Xi Jinping actually made this a demand. He said, if I'm going to come, if I'm going to have this meeting with Biden, I, I insist that I have a meeting with U.S. business leaders. Uh, and so that meeting is happening. It's, you know, the plates are going, it's, it's $2,000 a plate, $40,000 to sit at Xi's own table. It's I think one of the, the the clearest way to understand this is that Beijing has long viewed American business leaders or business leaders in, in any country in the world as a de facto pro Beijing lobby. It's kind of a backdoor to U.S. politics. I mean, China gets that the U.S. political system is heavily influenced by corporations, heavily influenced by corporate. Uh, campaign contributions, and that that's a great way to get the attention of politicians and to get you know people with a loud voice in D.C. Uh, and in our national debate to speak up for softer on China policies. This has worked extremely well for China for a long time. In fact, in the 1990s, uh, you know, just a few years after the Tiananmen massacre, uh, President Clinton, you know, he campaigned in 1992 on a platform, you know, talking about the butchers of Beijing and how, how, how he was going to be tough on China. But within two years, he was the one who de-linked trade and human rights in the relationship with China. And we now know that he did that uh, in a you know, significant part because of extensive lobbying by business leaders in the U.S. who wanted access to Chinese markets, who who wanted money. And certainly China has benefited greatly from foreign direct investment and from having access uh, and partnerships with, with U.S. companies and with U.S. markets. So it, it is a win-win for uh, American business leaders and, uh, and, and Chinese leaders, as long as you don't care about human rights or political values. Um, you know, which, which speaks to the main point that I try to make in my book, that we shouldn't leave this up to business leaders 
that political values are you know within the realm of governance and, and shouldn't be left up to the to the market to decide. I want to pick up on your last point there about the business leaders and uh, you know the motivation, which is profit. Uh, but that are there things that China has been doing in the last number of years uh, that for business leaders, they may not care as much about the human rights or political values question, but they will care about things that may impact the effectiveness of their business operations. And uh, I had some students ask about this, uh, that uh, they, they wanted to know more about the increased demand for Western foreign companies uh, to create the, the party cells. You talked a bit about the liaison at Zoom with the Public Security Bureau, uh, but the idea that, uh, you know, the Chinese employees uh, organizing party cells and the sense that before that might have been seen as sort of pro forma, fine, we have a party cell, but the idea now that that party cell wants to uh, vet candidates for promotion, it wants to be able to uh, uh, dictate uh, corporate policy, business policy, uh, how are what's happening with that? And and is there a point at which even a, a Western business leader who says, fine, I'm not interested as much on the value side is going to say this is too much interference in my bottom line. So what's happening there with these demands for Western firms uh, to to have much more uh, to be much more integrated into the party's command and control structure? Yeah, so there's a, you know two parts to your question. Um, to, you know, to the first, are there are there practices in China or are there are there government demands that are, have been harming the bottom lines of, of U.S. companies? And the answer is yes. There are numerous long-standing practices, um, including, for example, forced technology transfer. So the idea, so so there's you know laws in China that require in many situations that foreign companies find a local joint venture partner if they want to engage uh, in investment in China. And what has happened over and over and over again is that the joint venture, uh, the, the, the Chinese partner requires that the US company hands over their technology in order to form this partnership in the first place. And so the US company does thinking it's, you know, they'll still make a lot of money uh, from it. And then the Chinese partner ends up, you know, kind of absconding with that technology and making a ton of money and the U.S. partner gets shut out of the market. This has happened over and over and over again. And there was a report a few years ago from the U.S. Trade Representative's office about this and the complaints that they had heard from U.S. businesses. But it took a long time. It took a long time for that practice to finally um, upset enough U.S. businesses and to hollow out enough of them and force enough of them into bankruptcy for this to really be raised up to the level uh, of as something that the U.S. government was was interested um, in in pushing back against. Uh, in addition, I mean, there there are many many barriers to U.S. companies um, in China. But what we've seen in the past couple of years, uh, with growing in, in intensity, is this scrutiny of U.S. business businesses in China and especially. Um, companies such as you know, auditing, auditing firms or due diligence firms, in part as a result of China's uh, data laws and um, amendments to recent amendments to its cybersecurity law, which, which basically casts all information as, as belonging to China. So any company that finds information and then you know, transmit that, that data across borders, that act of transmission of data could potentially fall under the remit of this law, which has been uh, very chilling for business. We've also seen the Chinese uh, Chinese authorities launch raids on you know uh, big accounting firms, including Bain and and others, uh, and just similar you know really ratcheting up the pressure over the past year and a half. Including uh, another thing is, is exit bans, so you know, targeting. American and other foreign business executives with exit bans, which means they're not in prison, they're not detained, but their passports have been taken away and they can't leave China due to an investigation or some kind of dispute or something like that. And uh, as a result of you know years of this, this year, in fact, just a, a few weeks ago, maybe last week, new data from China showed that for the first time in decades, 
foreign direct investment actually fell. It's been rising, you know, with, without stop for decades. Now, it's, it doesn't mean that it's dropped down to zero. It's just a little tick down. But the first time in decades that it that it's gone down. I want to go back a few years to I mentioned earlier the Trump administration's pivot to a tougher policy on China. And these trends were already apparent by 2015, 2016, 2017 within the, the U.S. business community. Now, the U.S. business community has never been and probably will never be the, you know, the, the loudest critics of Beijing. They're not. But what happened, there was a, a sea change where they went from always pressuring the U.S. government to make trade with China easy to start, you know, to, to walking back from that, saying, you know what, some things aren't so great here. So they, they'd stopped pressuring the Chinese government to have softer policies on China. And that was really a prerequisite for the Trump administration being able to adopt some of the policies that they did. And certainly, uh, oh, go ahead. No, I did, just also the, the, the question of the party. Uh, uh, yes, the political party going, to be in yes, that. Yes, political controls. What we've also seen under Xi Jinping, I mean, overall, you know, he has really revived the party and brought it back to the center of economic governance and political governance, even social governance in China over the past 10 years as he has been China's leader. And in the past five years, he's really targeted private businesses, both Chinese businesses and foreign businesses uh, with, with party control, whether that's, uh, you know, really uh, expanding party branches uh, outside of just state owned enterprises, also to just plain old private businesses, but also elevating those party branches to include people who are on the board uh, of, of companies and then making demands, using those party branches to make demands. This is part of a larger push. Um, there's also, for example, he's uh, Xi Jinping has elevated the status of the United Front Work Department and has explicitly put private businesses under the you know the supervision of the United Front Work Department. And that is that the, the United Front Work Department is a bureau of the Chinese Communist Party that is tasked with amplifying friendly voices and voices that are friendly to Beijing and, or friendly to the party and marginalizing dissent. So trying to bring all the different and disparate actors within Chinese society and economy um, under the larger umbrella of party control. And so we have seen that also now being targeted uh, to foreign businesses on Chinese soil. Um, I'd like to open up the chat um, and to your questions. Um, we're here for you. Um, we certainly always have many, um, you know, Bethany's book is robust with so many great examples. We can go on forever, but we want to give you the opportunity. So please put your questions in the chat. Um, and since you mentioned the United Front and, and uh, I'd like to maybe continue with that trend in terms of you know, influencing what you mentioned, and this was a number that I hadn't known, the 60 million Chinese in the diaspora um, and how, you know, this, this, you know, who are in business, who are students, who are in education, who are active in their communities and really using uh, these local connections, you know, going back to the top of our conversation um, to create kind of goodwill. Um, but also it's, you know, to create goodwill, but also maybe to, and I like how you put it in the book, um, to meet the people when they're local councilmen, before they become mayors, before they go to Congress, before they become senators. And and that's so interesting because it's the long game. And I don't think the, the U.S. plays the long game very well. Um, and, and China does, and this is one way. And you have a great example in, uh, of a, in your the book about an operative that ended up doing a little bit of damage in the San Francisco area, actually. So maybe we can talk about that a little bit since we're all in San Francisco today. Yes. Yeah, um, sure. So there was, uh, I think, one of the best slash worst examples I know of, of uh, China's, you know, uh, attempts to influence U.S. politics on a subnational level is someone named Christine Fong, who was a uh, a uh, suspected Chinese intelligence operative operating in the San Francisco um, Bay Area and the, the larger Bay Area from 2012 to 2015, and her strategy was, you know, she was um, she was um, under the direction of the Ministry of State Security, 
And what she tried to do and was very successful at was identifying up and coming political leaders. So mayors, city councilmen uh, who would become later become representatives or you know senators or, or whatever, becoming close to them, you know, establishing close and trusted relationships with them and being useful to them. And that, you know, from an espionage perspective, if, you know, you're a, a high ranking U.S. official and there's someone that you've known for 10 years, you know, your trusted friend, that's espionage gold. So she was very good at cultivating these kinds of relationships. Um, and, and in her case, you know, she used uh, sister city relationships, you know, speaking of a sub, of subnational engagement, she used a sister city relationship that she helped form between the city that she was in, in California, and a city in China as a kind of a launching pad um, for some of her outreach. She used that as a platform to attend uh, U.S. mayors conferences around the U.S. and made close connections with U.S. mayors. Um, and, you know, that, that kind of thing, you, you mentioned that it does damage. I completely agree with that because it, it takes legitimate organizations and legitimate grassroots people to people exchanges like sister city relationships um, or like, you know, the, the Asian American political action groups that she was a part of, you know, totally legitimate relationships. And it casts a pall of suspicion over them. So I think it's really wrong with the Chinese government to abuse this kind of genuine grassroots um, engagement in that way. Can I just uh, two finger on that? Because I'm fascinated by, you know, you're talking about, the, you know, an operative working in the Bay Area, uh, you know, the, the one of the you know, oldest American Chinese communities in San Francisco, and then it's been a big center of of Chinese immigration, but it's also been a big center uh, in the past, both for uh, Taiwan, uh, a lot of ties uh, in in the uh, Bay Area uh, Chinese community to Taiwan, and more recently to Hong Kong with support for the uh, the Hong Kong activists. Uh, so how does how does China also look at that? It's not just not just simply influencing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States, but also uh, you know trying then to influence. Uh, or to to decrease support for the Guomindang uh, that was you know traditionally and then for Taiwan and then uh, to try to prevent or or blunt uh, diaspora Chinese communities, particularly in the United States, uh, from supporting and sustaining the the Hong Kong movement, the democracy movement. Yeah, to to most um, to to answer your your question most thoroughly, I'll have to go back more than a hundred years to the fall of the Qing dynasty. So, uh, you know, the Qing dynasty, the last um, imperial dynasty of China, uh, you know, also pursued its critics. Uh, there were, you know, people who were, um, you know, pro-democracy intellectuals during that time and the Qing dynasty tried to execute them. So they fled into exile in Japan, Hawaii, the US, and they organized and, and did a lot of fundraising from, from exile including uh, Sun Yat-sen, who spent uh, quite a bit of time in the U.S. and later went on to found the Republic of China in 1911. And so the, the Chinese Communist Party, one thing they do well is they try to learn from history. So they look back at the fall of the Qing Dynasty and they say, these exile communities, these Chinese exile communities, they're very dangerous. And the CCP knows that firsthand because the CCP was also, um, you know, C early CCP members were, all, were also basically in exile from China. And they also organized and did fundraising like in the 1920s, for example, in, in 1930s in Japan, uh, and were able to come back in, in, to China and eventually overthrow the Republic of China. The CCP knows firsthand that pro-democracy sentiment uh, in overseas Chinese communities is an existential threat to them, or they view it as an existential threat. And so the United Front Work Department's original goal in terms of its international work was to fight, uh, the, was to essentially minimize support and minimize the voice of the Guomindang, uh, which was ruling from Taiwan. But after Tiananmen in 1989, when uh, you know, China let a lot of young pro-democracy, idealistic young Chinese people leave China when they, they flooded into um, you know, overseas Chinese communities in the 90s. Uh, 
the Chinese government's United Front, you know, the, the Chinese Communist Party's United Front Work Department really went into overdrive um, and set up a lot of organizations in, uh, you know, dozens of countries around the world to try to co-opt organizing in these communities um, and worked very hard to co-opt the existing organizations. I mean, overseas Chinese communities, like all communities, form organizations to help support their life. They have cultural organizations, you know, business uh, organizations, professional organizations, totally normal. The United Front Work Department tries to come in and co-opt them so that there are no, to try to make it so that there are no way, there's no way for pro-democracy or anti-CCP Chinese people to effectively organize abroad. Uh, and one result of this, and one thing I'd really, really like to emphasize here is that this is, this the, the most important result of that is that this is uh, an erosion of the rights and freedoms that people in Chinese communities in America and other democracies deserve to have. When, it, when it's harder for them to organize freely on US soil, to have their own Chinese language community newspapers that can publish freely whatever they want, this is an abrogation of their own rights uh, living in the US. And that's what the CCP is able to do. Um, and so, you know, an approach to try to fight this is not to look at Chinese communities in the US and try to find the spies, but rather to view it as how can we help restore the political rights and the civil rights that these communities deserve? What, what do they want from us you know, to, to help them be able to, to organize freely? And I think that's so important if you look at our First Amendment here, right? Freedom of press, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. Um, and, and I do think that um, there's much more to talk about on that in terms of um, how China's surveillance operation um, is able to promote disinformation and to get at, at these communities. Before I go there, I just, because, um, you know, you do have some recommendations at the end of your book that are really super strong. And one of our questions here comes in uh, from Saukat Anwar. Excuse me if I mispronounced that. Um, it looks like government control business in China and the business controls government in the U.S. What is the right way to go forward? You do have some recommendations on, on changes that we can make here in the U.S. Uh, for business government relations. And so I think it's probably about time for us to start looking at some of those. Yeah. Well, one of my biggest points that I that I want to make is that, you know, I, I refer to the way that the Chinese government uses the power of its economy to shape the decision making of, of governments and companies and individuals around the world to bring them more in line with the Chinese Communist Party's core interests. I call this authoritarian economic statecraft. And one major point in my book is that the way to push back against this is through building a democratic economic statecraft. Because prior to a few years ago, the way that we thought about this was that there wasn't really a role for government to push back against this. If a company, you know, decides to censor its own employees or decides, you know, to adhere to Chinese government censorship directives, there's nothing that we can, there's nothing that the U.S. government can do about that. Governments can't act on that. It has to be civil society action. All we can do is a, you know, a, um, a, a consumer boycott or we can have a hashtag. We can name and shame. But it's been proven time and time again that naming and shaming and uh, you know, consumer boycotts are not nearly enough to, to change the behavior of U.S. companies because the, the massive um, monetary incentives they get from the Chinese market like vastly make up for that, for whatever kind of reputational harm they might suffer temporarily in the U.S. market. You know, but, but more importantly, I think, and even just from a pragmatic standpoint, is that it's not the job of CEOs to uphold our political principles. That's the job of a government. You know, I, I think that with the embrace of what, you know, what I in the book call neoliberalism, you know, this idea that free market, free markets are the same thing as democracy. It's not just that free markets lead to democracy, it's that they are in fact the same thing. And that's just, you know, what we have learned in the past 30 years is that that is simply not true. You can have a capitalist country that is very authoritarian, 
you know, and I think what we have to do is restore the idea that it is a government's job to defend political principles and that it is uh, it, it's putting CEOs on a kind of a moral pedestal to say that they should willingly sacrifice hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue for free speech when we don't make those demands upon ourselves. So, you know, so, you know, functionally speaking, what should we do? I, I have 14 recommendations in my book, how to address this issue domestically, and then uh, a, more recommendations about how to address this uh, in, a, in a multilateral way. And I'll just highlight a, a few from each. So multilaterally, um, a, a suggestion that is, that I didn't come up with it, but I do support it um, very much, is the idea of creating something like an economic NATO. You can call it a mutual economic defense pact. You can call it a an economic article five, whatever. The idea that a group of like-minded countries agree in advance that if one of them, one of their sectors or their country overall is targeted by China's economic coercion, they will spring into action to help each other, to you know help to open their markets to pr products from the affected sector, perhaps to issue um, retaliatory uh, tariffs or some kind of um, you know punitive measure against China for this as a form of deterrent, and that this over time could help push back against the way that China kind of exports its authoritarianism. Domestically, you know, in the U.S. case, it, it's very difficult to um, to to address this in some cases because we do have a very polarized uh, politics at this time. But I, you know, really strongly. Uh, recommend that the U.S. adopt campaign finance reform to reduce the power of corporate uh, donations in our politics. I think that would be healthy for our society in many ways, but also very specifically on this issue, or even introduce a public finance option as many developed democracies have. Now, this is that's not a particularly realistic goal at this time, but I think in the long term, that's something that we should absolutely work towards. Something that is a little bit easier that I think would, would have you know, a bipartisan support is adopting FARA registries on the state level. So FARA is the Foreign Agents Registration Act um, adopted in 1937 that requires people or companies who are operating on behalf of a foreign government or entity to try to influence the U.S. national narrative that they file mandatory public disclosures. It doesn't forbid that activity it just brings transparency to it. So we know who's lobbying on behalf of a foreign power, but that only exists at the federal level. There are no state fairer registries. So back to the question of subnational engagement, foreign government lobbying or the you know lobbying by foreign um, government affiliated entities on the state level, there are no registries for that. There's no transparency around that. Uh, and I think that adopting fair registries on, you know, on a state by state level would be, I mean, it's just a win, it's a win-win all around. It's transparency, it doesn't actually prohibit anything, and it just makes American citizens and voters more informed. Speaking of being informed, um, a couple of times in the book, uh, you say that, you know, the information was not published, you know, by the government, and then it kind of didn't get out, and so there's this disconnect between what's going on, what the government might be looking at and investigating, and what the public knows. Right. How can we engage the public more in this conversation? Yeah, well, some of what I was talking about has gotten a lot better or is starting to get better. And one example that I that I bring up is that, uh, you know, just let's look at the period from 2012 to 2016. During that period, the Department of Justice, you know, their counterintelligence units um, was doing, you know, a, a number of investigations doing their work related to Chinese government related espionage, Chinese government backed espionage and industrial theft in the US, and also um, cases of political interference from, from China in the US. And they and in the Department of Justice, they were seeing that these cases just rising, you know, just exponentially of what the Chinese government was secretly doing in the US. But at the time, the kind of, you know, the operating um, idea or the modus operandi was for the DOJ to disrupt these uh, cases, to disrupt this behavior, rather than to pursue indictments and arrests. Why does that matter? 
because when the DOJ uh, disrupts, so their counterintelligence team disrupts a foreign operation, they, they eliminate the threat, but no one knows about it. There's no mechanism for that to become public as classified. But when the DOJ pursues indictments, those are public indictments, and in some cases, very long and very detailed with lots of information about what was actually happening. And so, you know, within the DOJ, they were seeing that what they knew and what was available, you know, behind the classified firewall about what the Chinese government was doing in the U.S., it was getting more and more and more and more alarming. But the U.S. national narrative about China was staying the same because people didn't know about what the Chinese government was doing. So during the Trump administration and continuing now into the Biden administration, there was a very conscious decision to stop simply disrupting operations, but to pursue indictments in order to get some of this information out there in the public space for people to know about, for policymakers to be able to debate, and thus to be able to formulate policies to better protect the American government, uh, to better protect the American people, American society, and American businesses from the Chinese government's actions. And this is something that we're, you know, like I said, we're continuing to see into the Biden administration. And something I have been particularly um, glad to see is that, you know, uh, now the DOJ has an, an office of transnational repression that pursues cases of surveillance, harassment, um, threats against uh, mainly Chinese people in the U.S. that the Chinese government doesn't like. It pursues those cases, uses the powers of government to investigate them, and then pursues indictments and arrests and trials of the people who were complicit in that. And that has done so much to get some of what has been done in secret for decades out into the light of day. So that we are now much clearer about the role of these, for example, United Front backed organizations in uh, transnational repression and trying to disrupt freedom of assembly and free speech um, in, in, in harassment and, and issues like that. So I, I have been very glad to see that. In, in bringing that up and taking a, a question that has come in from the audience on this uh transnational operations, restricting speech, controlling narratives, uh, working at the subnational and local level. Where did, where has the, the whole Confucius Institute project fit into this? Um, we, you know, we have, you know, the questions have been raised that, hey, you, uh, it's just, oh, it's just about learning the language, but then it's definitely seems to be an ideological component and the off-limit topics that you can't discuss and so on and so forth. So how does that fit into this uh, transnational strategy? Yeah, so there, there are two separate concerns with Confucius Institute. And the first is what you mentioned, the is issue of censorship. So Confucius Institutes are, um, you know, they're, they're sponsored by, or, you know, they're, they're under the Ministry of Education in China, so they're a government ministry. And that means that the curriculum that is taught there is going to be a Chinese government approved curriculum. And that means that they're going to talk about Taiwan as, as a right in part of China. They're not, they're going to talk about the happy dancing minorities in Tibet. Uh, you know, they're not going to talk about the real challenges of China's political system, et cetera. So there's censorship. Nothing happens happen. on June 4th. <laughs> right, right, right. As the, the what the famous South Park or, fam, or Family Guy or Simpsons episode has, you know, on this site on June 4th, 1989, nothing happened. Nothing happened. <laughs> Um, so that, that's baked in. Now, you know, in practice on the grounds, what Confucius Institutes do or do not do, or, you know, how proactive they are about trying to go, you know, go around and censor things really depends, depends on the local leadership. It depends just, it's, you know, sort of on a case by case basis, but that's, you know, structurally they're designed to censor. And, you know, that doesn't have any place on an American university campus, you know, um, that's, I think, what's problematic about it. Now, now, of course, language instruction is so important. And a, a real issue here is that for, you know, met, many colleges and universities don't have the funds to have their own Chinese language departments. And many of them don't have, you know, the kinds of resources that would make them um, appealing as a place, you know, to get funding from the U.S. government to form a, you know, a critical language program or something like that. 
Um, and so there's a shortfall of funding for Chinese for Chinese language education. And that's, I think, why Confucius Institutes did receive such a warm welcome in the U.S. At their, at their peak, there were more than 100 of them. But, you know, uh, as uh, concerns about the Confucius Institutes grew, um, there, has, there was a, a change in how the U.S. Department of Defense gives money for critical language funding. And so then there was a change that said, if you receive this funding, if you have a Confucius Institute, you can't receive this funding. And so as a result, mainly of that, but also just overall pressure, most of the Confucius Institutes have been closed within the past six years. And now there's only around nine left. But the, the other issue that is, I think, a little bit more complex and a little more subtle than just peer censorship is that there have been instances when, you know, the Confucius Institute has pressured a school beyond the borders of the ground, beyond the walls of the classroom to stop behavior on that campus or to not let things happen on that campus because it will make China, because it will threaten, it will threaten the relationship, right? It'll threaten the relationship. So that's a little bit different. What that is, is have the very presence of the Confucius Institute, in some cases, can be used as a, a kind of a hook. You know, we, we've hooked you. Yeah. You have this relationship with us. Now you need to maintain this relationship. And so it's kind of like this, it can be used as kind of a threat. If you do this, if you allow the Dalai Lama to come, whatever, maybe we'll we'll, we'll pull out, you know, we'll, we'll leave the school. And, and so that's a, a little different than just direct censorship. Tatiana, I think you're muted. Uh, and the, there you the, go. Same, the same internet problem from the pandemic. Um, so excited to keep talking about Beijing rules. We only have a few minutes left. I want to ask you, what are you working on today? What are you looking for as these leaders meet at, you know, what stance? is she making is he going to go friendly is he going to be threatening you mentioned some of these words you know there's this back and forth tension um what are you working on today um as we look into this summit um you know of of leaders on a national level subnational is there going to be a major announcement what can we expect Yes, so I think that Xi Jinping is making a, a real effort to appear friendly and accommodating while still appearing strong. This is gonna be different than we've seen Xi in, in several years. There's every sign that, you know, that the Chinese side is really, really wanting to come to, to several agreements, have real deliverables, and have the US-China relationship be on a sturdier and more stable footing going forward. And what I'm expecting is that the two leaders will announce the resumption of military to military communications. And the Chinese side cut, cut military to military communications after Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan last year, which the Chinese side saw as a major provocation. Now that matters a lot because um, there have been a growing number of military incidences in which the US and China absolutely need to talk to each other. And that's, we saw that in February with the Chinese spy balloon incident, you know, it went over the U.S., create, created a huge hole balloon. The U.S. military shot it down once it was over the ocean. And the Chinese side was, you know, very upset by that. Uh, and at that time, uh, the U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin tried to call, tried to make a call to his Chinese counterparts, and they refused to pick up the phone at this very sensitive moment. One of the other channels of communication that the Chinese side cut off last year was the MMCA, uh, which what that stands for at the moment ex escapes me. But it's about it's a it's a regular a regularly scheduled channel for for operator level people. I mean, people who operate ships, people who operate aircraft, uh, to get together in a room and or you know virtually and talk to each other about rules of the road, about just to get to know each other a little bit, to understand each other. So when there are encounters over the South China Sea in the Taiwan Strait, that the, the risks of miscalculation are lowered. And this is key because, you know, if there's, if you want to talk about risk mitigation, you know, but like what, what's the biggest risk that you want to mitigate that everyone agrees we want to mitigate? The risk of an unintentional military conflict. Countries want to go to war, they go to war. But you know, an accident, like a collision, 
something like this that results, you know, in, uh, in you know, catastrophic consequences that no one wanted. This is totally preventable. And military to military communications are, the, are one key way to prevent it. And we are expecting, and Axios reported last week, we are expecting those ties to be, those, those communications to be resumed. And that's huge. We're also looking at um, uh, an announce, an agreement that the Chinese side will work to crack down on the production and export of fentanyl. This is something that the U.S. side has been uh, demanding for a while. And uh, the Chinese side, again, cut off their participation in a, a, a fentanyl-related working group last year. Uh, and we, we just saw this week, after the U.S. and, and Chinese um, counterparts met, uh, a new climate announcement climate cooperation announcement. And I, and I do expect for Xi and Biden to talk about that. They will also spend a lot of time talking about Taiwan. Now, we are not expecting any kind of announcement, any kind of new public assurances on the issue of Taiwan. It's, it's already very tense. You know, I, I live in Taiwan. Ever since Pelosi visited last year, the Chinese military has made almost daily and sometimes very large incursions into Taiwan's near airspace and across the, the midline in the Taiwan Strait. Very aggressive. And the Chinese side, you know, views the U.S. and its increasingly warm unofficial relations with Taiwan, uh, again, as a major provocation. So, you know, the, the relationship here, the concerns about Taiwan and the risk of a, a U.S.-China conflict over Taiwan are very real and, and very serious, but it could always get worse. And so having, you know, you know top level talks to try to prevent it from getting worse is, is also key. So we are looking for that. And finally, we do expect Xi and Biden to talk about Israel, uh, the Israel-Hamas war, the Russia-Ukraine war, and other serious uh, conflicts that are happening right now on the world stage. Well, Bethany, we'll be looking forward to your reporting on the issues. Um, Bethany Allen, author of Beijing Rules, How China Weaponizes Its Economy to Confront the World. Go get it. It's super important, especially on a day like today where big news is happening. Thank you, Bethany. Thank you so 